Okay, to mehi ki a kouta kuto mai nei i tene um, ahi ahi. Um, hey, kara kia um, tuatahi ki te faka um, faka wati te papa mote kuriro um, o tene ra. Tene o te naki nei a rongo rongo matane rongo marae roa rongo tu tangata matua. Mono rongo ki rongo ki te fenua. Mono rongo ki rongo ki te tangata. Kariri rongo na ina fakatipuranga. Kaputa ka ora. Riri riri hana. Hi ma riri. So kia ora everyone. Welcome, um, welcome to this Plastic Free July um, event talking about the Global yeah. Plastics Treaty. Yeah. I'm Kathy. I'm from the Zero Waste Network. Um, and I'm just going to ask everyone if you can please mute yourself um while we're talking and we've got a wonderful um discussion and corridor that's going to be led by Liam. time to just get rid of something the... there yeah. it happens every once in a while i got to just take some <laughs> gabriel can i ask you to mute yourself thank you um so i'm just going to hand over to liam prince from the aotearoa plastic pollution alliance to introduce the corridor and our various guests and thank you again all for being here kia ora val thank you so much um and kia ora, kia ora tato um yeah thanks for coming along to this um corridor for plastic free july um i'm the chairperson of the aotearoa plastic pollution alliance um and have had the privilege to work with some of these amazing people who are here today um to corridor with us so um we've got tricia farrelly who's the coordinator of the scientist coalition for an effective plastics treaty uh, we've got Matt Perryman, who's the coordinator of the Tangata Whenua Coalition for an Effective Plastics Treaty, um, and also Jerissa Lee, who's a campaigner at um, Greenpeace um, and a member of the Tangata Whenua Coalition, um, and Olga Pantos as well, who's here from ESR, um, who uh, has been involved in the Global Plastics Treaty uh, negotiations recently as well. Um, we had hoped to have a couple of our um, friends from Fiji who are members of the Aotearoa Plastic Pollution Alliance. Um, I just want to acknowledge them anyway and the mahi that they do. Um, Rufino um, Varia, who um, I think maybe recently finished his PhD, um, but as a member of the Scientist Coalition as well, um, and has uh, recently um, started a job as the regional coordinator of the Pacific Islands Climate Action Network. Um, he's doing amazing mahi. And, and also Andrew Paris, who's a researcher and the environment coordinator with Blue Prosperity Fiji, who's been also involved in, in this um, treaty negotiation. So yeah, what an awesome um, group of people here today. And yeah, because it is Plastic Free July, um, it just feels like what better way to, to acknowledge and, and commemorate this month, if that's the right word, then to talk to some of the leading experts in Aotearoa um, and in the Pacific and in the world, really, about the biggest conversation in plastic pollution right now, which is this Global Plastics Treaty. Um, the idea that we need an international, uh, we, that we need international cooperation uh, to combat plastic pollution, and it's not a new idea. Like climate change, like the climate crisis, plastic pollution is a transboundary issue. It doesn't respect borders or territories. Um, and many people have been pushing for some sort of international cooperation or agreement on this issue for many, many years, including some of our experts here today. Um, but finally, in, in early 2022, um, member states of the United Nations Environment Assembly agreed to a resolution to end plastic pollution and develop a legally binding agreement that would address the full life cycle of plastics. And ambitiously, that would be agreed um, and negotiated by the end of this year, 2024. Um, it was um, both, both of those aspects I just mentioned were quite big wins, both that the agreement um, is to be legally binding, not just a voluntary agreement with weak accountability, um, but also that it should address the harms across the full life cycle of plastics, um, all the way from extraction through refining, manufacturing, transport use, disposal, and leakage into the environment. Um, and that means that the wide ranging impacts of plastic pollution on human and environmental health um, should be addressed. That includes climate change impacts, um, the effects of hazardous chemical additives, micro and nanoplastics, and of course, you know, the harms to wildlife and ecosystems of plastics escaping into the environment. So since, um, since that agreement in early 2022, there have been four sessions of um, the uh, sorry, Intergovernmental Negotiation Committee, 
um, and those are known as INCs for short, um, as well as there's been a lot of intersessional work on various aspects of the negotiations between the INC sessions. So INC1 was in November 2022 in Uruguay. Uh, INC2 was in May, June 2023 in Paris, INC3 in November 2023 in Nairobi, Kenya, um, and most recently INC4 in April this year was in Ottawa, Canada. Um, and the fifth and supposedly final session, um, or INC5, will be held in November, December later this year in Busan, Korea. Um, whether or not that is going to be the final session is, I think, maybe a bit up in the air, um, and we might talk about that today. Um, so at these sessions, it's the, the member states of the United Nations who really get to, uh, ultimately gets to, you know, vote and make decisions on the agreement itself. But there have been many observers participating at these sessions too, including the likes of the Tangata Whenua Coalition um, and their Fenonga and the Indigenous Peoples Caucus, um, the Scientists Coalition, also our friends at Gaia and Break Free From Plastics and, and many others. But also it includes the plastics industry, um, who for a number of those sessions have outnumbered representatives from civil society organizations. So as you can imagine, the negotiations have been pretty fraught. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot I've missed, but I just wanted to give everyone here a bit of a background of what we're talking about today. Um, and without further delay, I, um, yeah, I want to hear from our guests today. Um, and uh, also, you know, keen to, to have questions from everyone attending today as well, and um, we'll get a chance to ask some questions later in the session. Um, feel free to write your questions in the chat uh, as we go, or wait till towards the end and you can ask them yourself. But I thought it'd be good to start with um, hearing a bit more about the work of, of um, each of you who are, who are here to speak and, and what angle you've been approaching these um, the Global Plastics Treaty negotiations with. So maybe start um, with you, Tricia, if that's okay. Um, yeah, it'd, it'd be cool to hear from you about who is the Scientist Coalition for an Effective Plastics Treaty, what's your role with them, and also, like, what, um, why a Scientist Coalition is needed. Like, yeah, what, what's the importance of that? So, kia ora. Kia ora, Liam. So yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm one of the three co-coordinators at the moment. I was coordinator, now I'm sort of having to, with my new job, sort of spreading the load a little bit amongst the other co-coordinators. Um, and the Scientists Coalition for an Effective Plastics Treaty uh, was established um, at the beginning of INC1 um, because there was so, so much science, mis a kind of miscommunication, misinterpretation, um, lots of... Um, uh, false facts being thrown around the science of plastics, um, including uh, United Nations Environment Programme reports that go out to member state delegations um, to, and they're supposed to support them and assist them in, uh, in the negotiations of this global plastics treaty mm -hmm. that we are supposed to have uh, approved, finalised at the end of this year. Um, and because of the vested interests involved in a lot of the science uh, surrounding the Global Plastics Treaty, um, not just in um, those reports that are circulated internationally to delegations, but also outside of that space to the public, um, where um, a lot of the information from sometimes really sound industry scientists um, are kind of... Um, misappropriated and twisted around and reframed and repackaged to meet the needs of the industries to which they are fund, uh, where they're funded from. So their PR agents essentially spinning a lot of the stuff and, and feeding it to the public, which is um, was quite dangerous. That's why we set this up. Um, so we're a body now of 400 um, independent scientists all over the world, come from a whole range of different disciplines and backgrounds. Um, and we have to sign a very robust conflict of interest policy to join um, the coalition. Um, we have two tiers, one of which are um, observer members and some of the people in this space joining us today are observer members because of some elements of conflict of interest. For example, they might be involved in 
um, lobbying groups or uh, civil society groups, um, and then we've got our core members. And it, but essentially, it's it's about being really transparent. Our role is primarily to support negotiators th through the treaties by through the treaty by providing them with robust, independent um, science. Great, thank you. Um... Matt and, and Teresa as well, I, I'd love to um, invite you to, to um, talk about the Tangata Whenua Coalition. Um, Matt, your role as the coordinator um, and Teresa as a participant. And um, just uh, your reflections on why it's important that Indigenous peoples and perspectives are represented in these negotiations. Uh, I'm Liam and I'm here, um, Valerie and Tracia for speaking before. Um, shout out to Andrew and Tracia, uh, Teresa for being here today with us as well, hopefully speaking after us. Um, Andrew's a member of the Scientist Coalition as well as uh, myself and Tracia um, and Rafino who can't be here today. Um, but today we'll speak about the Tanga Tefinoa Coalition. So um, if you haven't heard about us, the Tanga Tefinoa Coalition um, kind of branched off from APA. Um, it's the Tanga Tefinoa um, Ropu focused on the Global Plastics Treaty. We do a lot of work with MFE and MFAT um, to try and lobby and get our positions across. But our main kaupapa is to hold up Te Treaty and um, Hea Whakaputanga, um, also Maturanga Māori and Tikanga Māori in the Plastics Treaty development and implementation spaces, um, which has been uh, an interesting process so far. Um, Reflecting on the last couple of years, it's been unexpected how things unfolded, um, although in some ways expected with this new government. Um, we'll talk a bit more about the cabinet mandate shortly, um, but just to give you a bit more back background on the Tangata Whenua Coalition, we have members from Parakore and Eco Matters, Greenpeace, um, scientists, researchers, educators, community leaders, um, a range of other groups, research institutes, um, and um, sorry, I should have prepped a bit more for this one. Um, reflecting on INC4, do we want to go into that yet or do we want to wait for a bit of a round table? Maybe we'll just, um, just yeah, get a bit of a sense of your participation and, and, the, and the, the treaty negotiations itself and we'll, we'll dive into INC4 a bit later, eh? I think. Yeah, um, so a lot of our work on, on the ground at INCs is with the Indigenous Peoples Caucus. So Teresa has become one of the co-coordinators of the Indigenous Peoples Caucus. Um, massive applause for Teresa for taking on that mantle because it's a lot of mahi, but really wanted to have someone from Aotearoa representing the Pacific as well um, at that level, able to help negotiate with the different agencies of the UN. Um, so the Tangata Whenua Coalition and the Indigenous Peoples Caucus overlap quite a lot in terms of the mahi that we do at INCs. We're basically lobbying governments um, speaking with scientists and other groups, especially the Scientist Coalition, are an important ally. Um, and we uphold each other and try and make as much interventions and make as much noise as we can um, in the plenaries. Although as observers, because Indigenous peoples aren't classified as nations in the uh, United uh, Nations system, um, we don't have that voting right or that participation that other governments and member states have. So we have to... Uh, participate as observers, which means that we have limited access to plenary and speaking. Um, we can't take the floor until often very late at night. Like, for example, during INC4, we only got to speak at about 2 a.m. some of the nights, and one of them was even 3 a.m. And it was at the very last moment, so it wasn't like it was affecting negotiations. We just had to get our, our voices in somehow. But that's kind of how the UN system works as a colonial system. Um, so we're working with that. Um, against that in the ways that we can, in the same ways that we work with the NZ government as independent Māori experts. Uh, maybe I'll pass over to Jurassic to talk more about the Indigenous Peoples Caucus. Tēnā uh, tātou. Um, for those who don't know me, um, kia ora mai tātou, ko Jurassa tōku ingoa, um, he uri tēnei nō... No Pawaringa, no Taimai, uh, no Timuana Nui Akiwa Hoki. Um, I am a campaigner at Greenpeace, um, formerly a plastics campaigner. Um, so uh, still, but still working on plastics in my spare time, I think. Um, and 
my experiences, uh, you know, I just want to total call everything that Matt says. Um, the UN system is was was not created by us, so it wasn't created for us. Um, and so it is um, quite a, a load to deal with. Um, I just, I guess, just you know, w working in a system that is um, different, you know, different to how to how we like to exist within our own communities uh, and and within Indigenous communities, um, and. Then you add on that you're like severely outnumbered and your voice is heavily marginalized in those spaces. Um, yeah, a a and it's a lot. And, you know, I do hear from people sometimes who say, why would you go there? <laughs> but, you know, I feel really strongly about being there because, I, I mean, I could sit, at sit on my bed at home and curse these systems or I could turn up in front of them and make them see me um, and make them listen to me. And so, I, and I think that's really important that we do that and really proud of us, Matt, you know, that we, um, that we somehow find that, that strength and that energy. And a lot of that strength and energy comes from the coalition that we're part of. Um, and again, from the Indigenous People's Caucus that we've, sort of formed from um, just after INC1. So the Indigenous People's Caucus is, I think, at the last INC, there were 28 of us on the ground from um, as many parts of the world as we can. Um, and so that's just an idea of how sparse and how light we are on the ground. And so we formed the caucus to provide support to each other, um, not just moral support, but to help each other in our lobbying, to kind of strengthen our voice on the ground, to connect with our own, um, you know, each of us have um, connections into different member states, and so that's really helpful to, um, to have Indigenous people from, from say, Alaska, um, you know, have it, have an have a have an audience with uh, the EU or the Australian government. Um, yeah, so it's really useful in that in that way that we get to be part of this Indigenous Peoples Caucus um, and form kind of like baseline position statements together. Um, and uh, what I've noticed is that at each INC that we get to, we become stronger, we add more members, um, and we get a little bit more organized, and our voice gets a little bit louder, and um, we talk. We get in front of more and more um, member states and um, get to talk about, you know, what's important to us. And what's important to us, I think, um, really is a lot simpler than I think um, – people or member states or um, industry try, try to make out. But real, all it is is I think that bringing in an Indigenous worldview and um, offering um, our Indigenous knowledge systems as solutions and alternatives to uh, plastic pollution and this, you know, um, runaway plastic production is as an opportunity and um you know it's an opportunity to bring people in a decision making space or to make a decision making space um diverse and better informed and um i think that really to me that is really what it is and it's in, in the most simple explanation is just adding value to um to court or to decision making to discussions um to the formation and the creation of of a treaty um 
you know, we sit in the Indigenous, Indigenous Peoples Caucus in our meetings and we talk about our respective cultures and respective um, knowledge systems and things like what circularity means to us as Indigenous peoples who have had, who have practised forms of circularity for hundreds or thousands of years. And um, it's exciting. And so all we're trying to do as an Indigenous Peoples Caucus is to bring all this, you know, um, all this knowledge and excitement, you know, out, out into what is otherwise a very, very boring um, <laughs> and monocultural space. And um, yeah, and and I see I see the light in people's eyes sometimes, and I see people who are part who are on member state delegations. I see things click in their behind their eyes um, when we say things. Not just me and Matt, but um, a whole lot of people in, in our Indigenous Peoples Caucus and even further um, throughout our coalition. And so. I, I know, I know we're we're onto something. You know that we're on the right, we're on the right walker. Um, because even if the actions don't follow through, I can hear it in in the court at all that 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 they recognise um, what we're saying and they understand. Um, yeah, just just how useful uh, we are. You know, our, we are with our experiences and our and our knowledge. So yeah. Um, I've kind of gone off on the tangent there, but um, yeah, I'm very proud of us. You know, very proud that the Tafenua Coalition and the Indigenous Peoples Caucus are able to be this um, alternative way of thinking uh, and this alternative presence um, in that space, and you know. And, and also want to acknowledge that it is very hard. When I say we had 20 people on the ground, we were outnumbered by industry one to seven. Um, and the industry presence just grows at every INC. Um, and to step out of our, out of the UN, out of the building, and um, there'll be taxis waiting outside and they're all branded with plastics, um, industry messaging uh, and propaganda um, you walked through the airports when you arrived and it's on those um, electronic billboards if, right through the airport. Um, there were trucks that were saying, you know, we don't need the UN to tell us what to do about plastic. And it was everywhere and it was, um, yeah, so the presence is very strong. And so I'm really proud that we stand up really just as, as equally as strong against it. Yeah. Kia ora, Teresa and, and Matt, and thank you, like, just on, yeah, on behalf of all of all of us here in, in Aotearoa and Pacific for, you know, for your energy and, and, and yeah, making the effort to go and, yeah, have your voices heard. It's, yeah, just really thank you for, for your mahi. Um, uh, kia ora, Bula, Andrew, thanks for joining us. Um, would you like to just say um, a few words about um, your your contribution to the Global Plastics Treaty and how you, what capacity you've been participating in them with as well? It's a very valuable, Liam, full of full everybody. I'm just going to start by saying, you know, Teresa, that, that tangent you went on kind of really struck a chord with me. Um, and I wish Rukun and Mudia, I think you can speak to that better and um, speak to the need for for more alternative voices for more indigenous uh, perspectives uh, for for more indigenous participation and um input you know, into the negotiations or um processes uh, this is something that's super important for us um, but also um, as, as a country at at all um where 93 percent of all the land is owned is under traditional ownership all our coastal areas uh, are under co-ownership uh, with indigenous communities as well, um, indigenous people through. Um, so this is something that's very important for us, um, but from an, personally, but also from a government international standpoint. Um, Liam, yeah, just to answer some of your questions. Um, I am the te technical advisor for the, the Fiji government uh, for the Global Plastics Treaty. Um, 
I do this uh, um, as a side job, as almost like a labor of love. It's it's late um, late in the weekend, late on week night week nights and weekends strictly. I have a forty hour eight to five job um, that doesn't um, directly um, revolve around plastics. Um, so this is something that um, you know what that we don't get paid for. This is something that we do because we are committed to it, and we believe that uh, um, that uh, our voices are important, and um, that we can make um, an impact uh, in in steering um, the negotiations uh, to a more um, to a place that is agreeable to to, to Fijians, to Pacific Islanders, uh, um, and Pacific Islanders as well. <clears throat> um, I I joined uh, in. Um, leading up to INC3. Um, before that, uh, I was outside the process. I was making, um, we were making submissions to the Fiji government. Um, and there, there was a recent change in government uh, in uh, late 2022. Um, and a change to the Ministry of Environment uh, that allowed uh, more participation um, and more. Uh, Sorry, more diverse participation from from within the country as well. Um, so yeah, it's been very um, challenging, but also very rewarding. And I feel that it's it's only going to get more spicier as we move into intersessionals and 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 IC five. Um, yeah, I, I also didn't really prep for this. Um. I love to just tune in and, and listen to, to some of the great minds on here, uh, Matt, Teresa, and the esteemed Professor Tricia. Um, but happy to answer any more specific questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's awesome. And yeah, just again, just so glad to have people like yourself, um, you know, participating and, um, and, you know, keeping keeping member states on on, on the right track with, with some of this mahi. So thank you. Um, and just finally, Olga, I'd love to invite you just um, as well to say a few words about your involvement with the Plastic Treaty and your mahi in the space. Thanks, Liam. Uh, can you hear me? I've had issues with my headphones. All good? Great. Um, yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for inviting me to speak, Liam. Um, so I'm a scientist at ESR based down in Christchurch and I have to say this room is absolutely freezing so if I start shivering I'm not nervous well I am nervous but it's mainly because I'm cold the heating's not come on um so my background's in marine biology and looking at corals coral reefs in the tropics and the effects of human activity and since moving to New Zealand and there not being quite so much tropical coral I've moved into the plastic impacts on the environment space and specifically microplastics. So I've been um, leading a large project looking at the source, face, and fate and impacts of microplastics across different environments. So my involvement through the Scientists Coalition with the Plastics Treaty is um, you know, supporting that the science, having it, you know, every the decisions so they're based in science and looking at those impacts of plastics um, and also now starting to look more into the alternative substitutes for the current plastics we have um well the conventional plastics and ensuring that anything new that comes out is as good as they are trying to claim it is and so we don't end up with more more problems at the end of the day and and that these things are compatible with um, the environment and nature as well. So that's where sort of my, hopefully my support and input into the, the treaty um, is coming through. Um, and I, I did observe INC1, um, but online, because back then you, it was hybrid. Um, and I, I followed part of it, it was hard, with, with being in New Zealand, everything seemed to start at one in the morning. Um, but I was able to go along to INC4. And something that, well, there were two things that really struck me. One, Jurassa highlighted very well that the process is awful and really doesn't, 
it, it, it's not doing the job well to ensure um, that the, the environment and human health is put first. The, the system isn't set up to actually achieve, I don't feel what it claims it wants to achieve. Um, and that there are so many member state nations that um, are unaware of the problem, or well, they're sort of split into different groups. So there are the nations that are completely ignoring the science because it's too inconvenient for them. So they're just going to trudge along the way they want to go. Then there are nations who um, they just don't have the capacity in country to be able to access this information. And some of them are taking on board what some of these other nations who blindly just want to keep on making plastic and throwing away plastic. So they're being misinformed. Um, and then I've lost my trend of thought. Um, and then the, the other nations, they, they, they know what they want. They, they're striving really, really hard to, to fight for the right thing to do. Um, but it seems so much of a numbers game. Um, the, there's not the balance there, which is really hard to, to watch um, because all through my research career, the focus has been on protecting the environment and it just seems so obvious to me <laughs> that this is what we should be doing. And to see some some of the negotiators just completely disregard any of that. Um, and it all seems to be out about money um, and politics. And um, so I, I did find quite a lot of that quite um, challenging, being in person in these and listening to some of the, the negotiations that were, well, the conversations that were going on. Um, but it's definitely an eye opener. And hopefully I'll be able to uh, attend INC5 and provide as much support as I can to ensure that this is um, a decisions are based in science. Thanks, Liam. Thank you, Olga. Thanks for that. And and um, yeah, really um, great um, reflections on INC4, which is um, a nice segue into what I'd love to hear from others. Um, yeah, on we, we've just, yeah, a couple of months back had, had this fourth negotiation session. Um, that Olga's been talking about. So I'd love to hear some of your reflections on that session, some of the, you know, highlights and lowlights, um, key takeaways, um, you know, some of those um, good and bad member states um, and how they've been acting in these negotiations, um, including... The New Zealand government, you know how how they're doing it. I know there was a lot of excitement when the announcement was made back in March 2022 that this this whole thing was going to be negotiated. Um, and to you know, over two years on, um, you know, where, what's the feeling now? What's the mood of of how progress is is going? Are we are we on track to get a to get a good, um, comprehensive, uh, ambitious treaty to end plastic pollution? Um, yeah, how how are people feeling about that? Both both the details of INC4 and kind of the the bigger picture and just also a reminder for um for everyone listening please, please feel free to um throw in questions uh into the chat and we can you know um our, our friends here can can answer them as we go or um or i can throw some questions their way as we go as well so yeah um who, who'd like to share some reflections on where we're at in inc4 Tricia or Matt or Dressa. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. <clears throat> Get everybody up to speed with where we're at, if you like, as well. So, I mean, at INC three, we didn't have um <clears throat> what we call you know, the mandate for what we call intersectional work. We haven't had intersectional work, and intersectional work is kind of the the mandated work that happens between these big sessions. So, for example. Um, now we're between INC4, which we, we were talking about before, and that was in Ottawa, Canada, and now we're heading to the, what may be the final um, negotiating session in Busan, South Korea. And between that time, there's a fair bit of space. Um, and so um, we do finally, at least one of the positive things, I think, out of INC4 was that we do have a mandate for mandated you know, work between those, between, um, those two big sessions. And what we 
left with now is we have a couple of um, expert groups. Expert group one is really focused on kind of sourcing and financing um, for the treaty. And the other one is really a science-based expert group. And that's focused on um, chemicals of concern, but but in specifically to plastic products, not in and of themselves. Um, and I guess sustainable production and consumption is kind of what, what they're looking at, product design um, and that kind of thing. So they might sort of stick to the stick to the you know products for recyclability, which would be very disappointing. Um, but those are the two expert groups. And we have three uh, online intersessionals for these expert groups mm. and one um, in-person meeting, and that will be held uh, from the 24th to the 28th of August in Bangkok. Um, so, so that's great. We also have a, another um, we have another draft of the treaty that dropped, just dropped last night, actually. Um, and that has a lot of brackets. There's still thousands of brackets in there. It's a synthesized version of the previous uh, draft, which was around 70 pages. Uh, that previous draft is not a negotiable text. And we're looking at this today. This is not a negotiable text either. So we, we actually don't have anything we can negotiate which is why there's big questions as to whether or not we're going to have another session past INC5 at the end of the year. Um, but looking at the what we have in front of us now, this, this latest draft of the Global Plastics Treaty text, um, I think what's going to happen, if you, were, if you were to ask my personal opinion, I think that blocks of countries are going to get together and come up with a completely different option to bring to the table at IMC5. And I don't know that we'll have this draft as a, as a text we're going to be negotiating um, because I just don't see that we can negotiate this text. It's, it's 70 pages of brackets. Um, and when I say brackets, those are the texts that can be sort of left in, left out, negotiated. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a mess, quite frankly. Um, I just want to say too that uh, we have a CADVAT mandate as well from the New Zealand government. Um, and I'd like Matt and Jeresa to speak to that specifically, um, if they uh, would like to do that. Uh, so I'm going to leave that off this, this bit. But what I do want to say at this point is that even though we have expert groups, the only way our experts, and I say this in inverted commas, can get to those expert groups and, and engage in that process is if they are given a seat at on a member state delegation. So a member state has to say, I nominate you, Jerusa Lee, to be on our team. And then you can, and only then can you either engage in this process online at the three online intersessional expert groups uh, and or attend the in-person meeting in Bangkok. Now, these meetings are for experts. They're not for negotiators. It's not a negotiating meeting. However, the New Zealand government, in their wisdom, has decided not to take on any experts outside their own negotiators, and they're sending two of their own negotiators on the New Zealand ticket, which means that none of these experts you see before you, and of course there's many more besides here, and when I say experts, we're going to excuse the inverted commas, but I'm talking about knowledge holders, rights holders, I'm talking about the Mats, the Jeresses, the Rafinos, the Andrews of this world who really need to be there, um, it's virtually impossible for them to attend any of those um, because uh, most countries are looking for experts that are kind of, I guess, university trained professors and not necessarily civil society experts who are frontline fence line community members, indigenous rights and knowledge holders. Um, they're not um, informal workers working in cooperative kind of situations and contexts, not waste pickers. Um, so the democratic process for the intersessionals is highly questionable. Um, and I think that there's been a huge breakdown between the UNEP secretariat uh, and the chair uh, and the INC. So there's a, like there's different kind of governance sort of structures that are making these decisions. And I think there's a bit of, bit of a breakdown there. But I'll just, I'll, 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 I'll drop there because I'd really love Matt and Jeresa perhaps, or anybody else to speak about the mandate or, or anything else as well. I'm really keen to hear from them about that. Awesome. Thank you, Tracy. I can jump in there unless Teresa has some Ficaro to start with or someone else. Um, I'd say the mood right now is a little uncertain. Um, I want to remain hopeful that we end up with a treaty that respects Indigenous rights and cuts plastics production and, you know, 
leads to chemical transparency and all the stuff that we need to make sure the plastics stop harming and killing us. Um, but before <laughs> we go into the government matter, which is quite a, it's going to be quite a, um, a negative analysis because the government has come up with a new mandate, <clears throat> sorry, a new mandate from cabinet for the negotiating delegation, which means that they can only work within this new mandate. It's published on their website now. Um, and it's really quite, quite bad. It violates Te Tiriti. It, it doesn't mention Māori at all. It doesn't mention Te Tiriti at all. Um, and there's a lot of uh, bad changes that we'll be talking about soon. But um, I'll touch on that point that Tracia brought up that about Bangkok and the fact that um, New Zealand hasn't uh, nominated anyone, any experts to attend, and it's the only way that we're able to attend. So this is a barrier for Māori as tangata whenua to attend the negotiations. Um, even just as observers, we don't even um, ask for funding or anything like that. It's just a, a place, a nomination, basically a letter to the UN allowing us to attend the meeting in Bangkok, the intersessional meeting. Um, but they've declined that, so we won't be able to go to Bangkok. Um, but at INC4, there were a couple of wins I want to talk about. I don't want to take away some of um, Jurassic's highlights as well, but um, one of the awesome things that we did was hold a press conference. You can see some of the videos and photos from that on the Indigenous People's Caucus and APA Instagrams. Um, I'll put links. I think there's already a link to the Indigenous People's Caucus Instagram in the chat, but I'll put an APA link in there too. Um, <clears throat> that press conference was awesome. It was all like mana wahine, um, Indigenous leaders from across the world, um, and also uh, Black representatives and um, gender diverse representatives. So it was really awesome to have that panel um, and a media media attention in that space in the UN. And um, I'll leave that to Dressa to talk about because Dressa was able to moderate that. Um, we also managed to meet with many um, governments and agencies and civil groups and get our um, positions and points across, although no one really... I felt that at INC4, people were a lot less, or governments were a lot less vocal and didn't want to push the, the envelope too far. And so we didn't get a lot of people speaking up for Indigenous rights, as we have seen in the previous INCs. Um, same with Indigenous participation, even just basic um, elements of the treaty that would keep it ambitious and end plastic pollution, like cutting production, um, weren't being mentioned very much. I also want to shout out to Andrew and Rafino because Fiji was one of the highlights of INC4, one of the leaders of all of the member states, I'd say, and pushing for a, member, uh, pushing for a plastics treaty that still you know wants to end plastic pollution um so thank you guys for keeping the the delegation at that high level um and yeah i don't want to i have a couple more points but it's related to the indigenous people's caucus so i'll just leave that to um Dressa, and then maybe we can talk about the cabinet mandate in a little bit Dressa. um yeah, I might just quickly add, um, yeah, definitely Fiji and our and our and our little Pacific um Pacific Island nations were definitely um leaders um in, in, in negotiations. And they have been actually throughout the INCs. Um and I think um I just I just scroll to uh, Hanny had a question, didn't you? Oh, two questions. Um, so for the Indigenous Peoples Caucus, um, what is probably a bottom line for us is um, ensuring that the plastics life cycle is defined as um, beginning at extraction. Um and also uh, we hold human rights uh, very strongly as well, um, very important. And particularly because we know, you know, as Indigenous people, you know, as, in, as people living in Indigenous communities, um, many of us having, I mean, our, as, in, as an Indigenous People's Caucus, all of our meetings are held in um with translators and we all speak English or Spanish. Um, you know, and, and for many of us, um that's our first language, you know, is the the colonizers language. And so we're, you know, we're all speaking from um 
a lived experience of colonization, um, not just in how we speak, but how we live and what we have um, and, and living in the margins um, in, in many of our cases. And so when we talk about human rights, we've got um, Frankie, for example, who's Tongva in Chumash, and for him, he, his communities are living beside, um, you know, a, a, a extractive activity, and so, you know, it threatens their drinking water. Um, when we were at INC4 in Ottawa, um, we got to hear, the plenary got to hear a very strong intervention from Janelle, uh, I forget her last name, um, she's from um, Omjong, and she brought the brought to the attention of the entire plenary that her community, just a, a few hours away from us, was um, experiencing um, was was under lockdown actually because of benzene leakage, and she was explaining to the plenary like benzene is necessary for you know polystyrene. And um, lockdown meant that when they don't know what else they can do, it means just locking themselves in their houses and shutting the windows. It means they can't go to work because schools and daycares and you know um, preschools are closed. And so they have to stay home with their children um, and not necessarily in a safe situation, but what else do they do? And it was interesting is not the word. Um, it was outrageous that we would um, at at that same INC um, have to listen to Janelle talk about the effects of extraction on her community for decades and decades and how people get sick um, from the exposure to the to this extractive activity. And yet we're having conversations trivializing what the plastics life cycle really looks like and where it really begins and excluding extraction and therefore erasing the lived experiences of her entire community. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, you see, so for the, indig in, for the Indigenous Peoples Caucus, um, bottom line is... Uh, the life cycle starts at extraction and we need a treaty that um, recognises that and addresses um, plastic production uh, or, in, or plastic, you know, um, and cuts plastic production. And um, in, in terms of human rights, that people who are living on the, on the front line, fence line communities, um indigenous communities coastal communities uh that their, their life uh, lived experiences um inform uh the, the treaty you know the creation of a plastics treaty uh so that all these shifts to the alternatives you know acknowledge all of those experiences and properly address all those experiences and um so that we have a treaty that is just uh, and and lifts all of those um, communities from from their position, you know. To to and we talk about just transition, but you know, um, just transition is kind of like a sometimes it's a hard term to swallow because it feels so broad, and you know, industry uses it too, like a just transition for industry is like how do we continue making money though when you're trying to stop it and to us just transition is about um human rights and human health for those who are most affected um and if we don't if we don't look after those marginalized communities and those most affected communities then we haven't we don't have a just or an effective plastics treaty at all Kia ora, Joseph. That's yeah. It's really um, it's it's powerful when you know you hear from people who are 
really on the front lines of these things and then yeah just just that that fact that their perspectives can be so easily ignored and um yeah bypassed by those who just uh, yeah just want to see you uh, continue doing what they're doing continue business as usual um and i i just kind of wanted to um ask a, a, a few questions around some just reflecting on some of the questions and 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 um, answers as well that Tracia you put in response to Hannah's questions there in the chat, um, <clears throat> just around some of the specific proposals or or topics of discussion that are that have been part of the negotiations and um, so things like I've I've heard some of you I, um, Teresa you talked about the need for extraction to actually be a recognised part of that full plastics life cycle of plastic pollution. Um, and also some of you have talked about, um, you know, the need to reduce plastic production as well. Like how do we actually um, get those things into the treaty? What does it look like? Um, what does it look like in practice? You know, how, how do those commitments get made? And, um, you know, I guess there's kind of like the technical aspect of that, like what would that in, in practice look like? But also there's probably the more, pressing um aspect of that which is how do we get member states to agree to that to those sorts of things as well so yeah does anyone have any any thoughts on those those big issues i could make a um some some suggestions i, I guess this is um very tricky it's a very tricky time because we're into the last few months before we're supposed to have a, a treaty. Um, and <clears throat> so you're wanting to bring along, along countries with you without scaring them off too much, which kind of feels a bit wrong when you come from a position like all of ours, where you feel very strongly about um, protecting everybody and knowing um, the impacts of plastics and all its various forms and novel like, you know, ecologies and, and, and so forth. So um, uh, I, I think we, we're sort of starting to be, we have to be quite, uh, strategic and really um, careful about how we ensure that that happens. Um, and one of the things I think is really powerful is, is talking about incentives for moving towards the top of the waste hierarchy rather than constantly talking about controls um, and, uh, you know, I guess um, punitive measures. So rather than the stick, the carrot, um, and sort of speaking in, uh, in those terms. Um, what's also, I think, been particularly powerful uh, is to speak to the economic cost, but also the social and environmental costs of, of not doing the right thing um, and really emphasising the fact that there are very, very few producers right at the top of the pipe here who are the most responsible for global production of plastics. There are very, very few. There are also very, very few um, fast moving consumer goods companies who are the biggest polluters globally. And so if we start to draw attention right at the top there to kind of simplify the picture before it becomes extraordinarily complex as, these, as the supply chain of petrochem and plastics becomes and I can show you a, an extraordinarily complex image of, of that to, so that you know so that we we recognize to to address this before it gets complex before we start losing track of who's most responsible um, I think is super important the other thing I would suggest too is that we keep reminding our governments both because they're the negotiators right they have the power here they wield the power in the in the treaty negotiations to keep reminding them of their obligations to their citizens, including their obligations to their indigenous communities and to, to women's rights, um, to the rights that are, that are hold for the environment, human rights, and there are a, a wide range of those that our countries should um, need to be responsible for, are obligated to meet the SDGs or whatever that our countries have signed up for. I think just holding that in their face cons consistently and making drawing the line, making the line as extraordinarily clear 
um, between those obligations and and perhaps some of the weakness in the way that they've been negotiating through the plastics treaty um saying you know you're not meeting those obligations you already have have held in these other agreements and and like and nationally as well mm, thanks for that Tricia. um just wanted to just um cover a couple of questions that are in the chat um and just acknowledging where um we're almost four minutes to 1 p.m. And I know some of you may have to go, but um, this feels like there's so much to talk about. Um, yeah, we'll we'll just, we'll, we'll do our best to sort of wrap up, but we might go over a little 1 p.m. if that's okay. Um, but yeah, obviously if people need to go, they need to go. Um, Janie from Sustainable Coastlines asked around the, the groups of the two working groups um, working on product design of plastics. Where are they from? How are they chosen? I think that's related to the intercessional work you were talking about, Tracia, potentially. Um, and yeah, what you've um, what you've said, it's uh, the only way people can be on those groups is to be um, part of member state delegations. Is that correct? Or is there another way um, they can be? No, so yeah. A few, there are a few sort of seats available for special invitations from the chair. Um, and Rafino has, as, as I understand, last I've heard, he's been given a chair. Um, sorry, he's been giving a seat, seat from the chair of the INCs to um, mm. suit to attend uh, the expert group meetings as a representative of the Indigenous Peoples Caucus. But I'll I'll, I'll leave that to Jerisa and, and Matt to confirm that that's still the case. But I understand them. Yeah, that's that's still the case as far as I know. Um, don't know if you know Jerisa. Um, but yeah, either chosen by the end of state or by the secretary themselves by invitation. There's no way to register as an independent observer for the intercessional period. Yeah, so yeah, I guess it just it seems to speak again to what you're saying to see the, the democratic participation in these processes just seems shocking, just absent. Yeah. Um, there's a question from um, Polly about reuse. Is the role of reuse starting to get recognized in the negotiations, like designing for reuse, scaling reuse systems to displace single-use plastics, reuse targets, et cetera? Anyone have a response to that? Um, yep, I can if you like. I mean, I, I think I think with the expert group too, um, I, I'm sorry, I, I recognise I've been quite negative today, and I really don't mean to. <laughs> but so there are some positives. There are some, there are some lights here, and one of the one of the, I think one of the um, the potentials here in the intercessionals is that in expert group two, even though it talks about plastics for products. Um, sorry, chemicals for products specifically, and it talks about, you know, it's quite an emphasis on kind of circularity of plastics, really, it looks like. Um, there is a real potential here, if we get the right people in the room, to push the conversation further up the waste hierarchy, because you can't have safe and sustainable products if you don't, if, if you don't control and regulate hazardous plastics chemicals. And we know there's 16,000 of them in plastics. We know that there's, and they're specifically plastics chemicals. They're not chemicals for other multilateral environmental agreements, which we keep on coming, people keep on saying, oh, but they're just chemicals. So we'll control them elsewhere. No, these are, these are plastics chemicals. They're, specific, they're found in plastics. And so if we're going to have safe and sustainable products, which is the focus of this expert group, invariably the conversation should go to controlling, get those chemicals. 1%, by the way, of those 16,000 plastics chemicals, only 1% are regulated in other multilateral environmental agreements. So we need to have those there because we can't have safe management, we can't have safe remediation, we can't have safe consumption, or even manufacturing, actually, if we don't have safe chemicals, plastics are chemicals. So that's important. The reuse part is part of that because we need to have safe and sustainable reuse systems. And so if we've got safe products, then we start talking about needing to move towards, we should be starting to talk towards, you know, moving towards reducing as much um, primary plastic polymers in the system as possible, 
regulating the chemicals regardless of what you know those sustainable you know, those those products are that we'll talk about next bit too and it should invariably lead to reuse refill repair manufacture redesign and all of those other things up the top of the waste hierarchy so that's that's why i see potential but we've got to get the right people in the room and that is my concern Sorry, Leah. Can I jump into just a total glitch here um, and say that um, I still feel that reuse and repping reuse Altidor here. Hey, Hannah, um, I know you're in there, um, but reuse is something that we're pushing all the time. But I feel that a lot of policymakers still misunderstand what reuse actually is and um, don't understand how it can um, be a better model for how we deal with products and materials and things like that on a systemic level. They think about it in terms of um, like, been in and very localized um, examples, even household level, and we need to be pushing them. I think this is a job for everyone in this room is to be um, making noise and calling out and ministers and whoever else um, you can um, get an email to and say what you think and just say um, whether it's banning chemicals, certain chemicals, or investing in reuse, whatever that is. I think um, everyone here can can have a voice in the negotiations if we just make sure that they know that we're pushing for reuse um, as civil groups and independent experts, and it's not just a couple of people um, with this this notion of reuse that, you know, <laughs> yeah, Hannah's laughing because reuse is, yeah, as much as we try, it's, it's hard, to, hard to get it through their heads sometimes. And just a just a, a, I guess a follow up point around this that is connected to the issue um, that's been discussed um, kind of um, in a slightly roundabout way, but is because there's so much um, industry influence in these negotiations, and you know, and also countries who are you know um, their economies are reliant on oil extraction and things like that. Um, you know, the need for these negotiations. You know, we, we have all these like great real solutions to the plastic pollution um, crisis out there and being being vocally talked about um, but but other uh, you know member states either not really understanding or not caring or you know actively had, having misinformation on them from from industry um, you know how do we ensure in this process that we that some of those conflict of interest elements are properly addressed and that you know the sources of where information is coming from um, is, is highlighted, you know, it's, I, I, it just seems to be, you know, this constant balance or this constant issue is, is, you know, if only we could get the right messages out there and, and have the misinformation and have the vested interests from industry, you know, painted it, it for what it is. And, and, you know, so, so what, what's the hope that we can actually address some of that, conflict of interest um, issues and, and what could that look like going forward? I mean, I could speak from the, the perspective of the Scientist Coalition, our efforts um, to ensure that there is a robust conflict of interest policy um, for the expert groups, but also for the future, what they call the science policy interface. That's the, the science body or the body of experts and economic interests and social you know, experts in the future instrument. It's usually part of a future instrument. It could be part of the science policy panel that we have at the moment that's developing around chemicals, plastics and pollution, or it could be in a different standalone, but that's another conversation. I think for the purpose of the intercessional work, which is the thing that's really front and foremost in our minds at the moment, is that we need to know who those experts are, you know, that are sitting at the table making these, not making decisions for us necessarily, but are guiding the conversation, guiding the science towards INC5. There are two different groups that need this conflict of interest policy. There's what's called the technical resource people. And uh, here's another uh, democratic issue. So these TR, this TRP or technical resource people are to be selected by the secretariat. There are going to be 12 people, uh, technical resource people per expert group. 
Now, that might be more or less. We don't know. But at the moment, all we know is they're going to be 12 and 12 or 24 in total for the intercessional expert work. But they're going to be selected by the secretariat. And then the question is, well, on what basis are those experts going to be chosen? Who are they going to be? And who do they represent? Who are their affiliates? So we want to know that there is a conflict of interest policy underpinning that selection process and that those individuals need to be known to everybody. Who are they and why were they selected? What is the expertise that they're bringing to the table? How are they guiding us all? Um, and likewise with the expert groups, which could be quite large numbers considering member states can, can, can select as many experts for those groups as they choose to actually. Um, so that's, that's something we've sent uh, letters to the chair, to the secretariat. We've been having meetings with them about that. And my understanding at the moment is that there are discussions at that level for the first time about that. I don't think it just comes from the Scientist Coalition, because we know that the Treaty Coalition of Civil Society Organisations, led by BFFP and others, have also sent those same letters because they have the same concerns. Thank you for that, Tracia. Um, don't know if Matt, you had you wanted to add anything? No, I just talked with Tracia. We need a, a conflict of interest policy. We needed it four INCs ago. Um, to be honest, it's hard to even differentiate between who is a government employee rep and whose industry because sometimes the government delegations have like 50 people on them. And I don't think all of them work for the government because these are petrochem states. And, you know, it just seems like people making the decisions are industry sometimes. So I don't know how we get delegations to be better regulated more conflict of interest policies at that level um to prevent it happening in the first place but yeah yeah i just i don't know what the answer is to be honest but i just support a conflict of interest policy i just yeah kia ora. um i just um acknowledging that it's we're we're almost at 10 past one so just wanted to um if if Tracia, Matt, Olga, um, I think Andrew and um, Teresa had to had to leave, but oh, Andrew's still here. Um, oh, I might be at another meeting, but just wondered if you had any kind of final reflections on, you know, where where we're headed from here. You know, INC five is just is coming up in a few months. There's this intercessional um, meeting in Bangkok and around the expert groups and. You know, it feels like from the conversation we've had today that there's just, it's extremely complex, it's extremely fraught, there's a lot of things that still need to be worked through, um, you know, and yet we're supposed to supposedly have this agreement by the end of the year. You know, where, yeah, how, how are you all feeling like about the progress we're making with this treaty and, um, you know, the hope that maybe even if it's delayed, if there's another session sort of, in the first half of next year, you know, do you see that we we might be able to get some breakthroughs between now and then, you know? Do um to Olga or Matt, do you want to give us a yes. your your <laughs> your thoughts? <laughs> go ahead, Olga. Oh yeah, I. It's, it's all such a difficult process for something that to me seems so simple. <laughs> what we need to do. Um, so I really, I'm just trying to be optimistic. And there are lots of people um, with a lot of passion and endless energy, <laughs> it seems. I always feel, feel exhausted by it, but everybody seems to yeah keep going. So... I'm just really, really hoping that we all can carry that energy forward and, yeah, get what needs to be done, done. Yeah, awesome, Olga. I just want to jump on that because um, one of the people that I think gets described is, this is I, I learned the word in, in describing someone described Tracia in this way, um, indefatigable, indefatigable. Like cannot be made tired. <laughs> I don't know how it's defined, but um, 
that's how I think of Trifia when I think about I've only been involved with this for a couple of years. Trifia has been doing it for so long, same as Olga, same as heaps of you guys. I don't know how you do it because the overlapping world between plastic pollution prevention and policy is just the biggest headache in the world. But it's essential to get right, of course. That's why we're all here. Um, so I just want to total call that um, and Olga always will work to get us um, well laden with research as well in Aotearoa, even if the government is being a little bit ho -ha. Um, <laughs> one thing I do want to touch on, and I don't want to keep on coming back to negatives here, but this is something that we need to keep calling out, and that's that the government is, the current government, the coalition government, has an extremely racist agenda. And the way it plays out in the plastics world, particularly in the Global Plastics Treaty, is obvious in the new mandate, the cabinet mandate. So we won't have time to go through all of that right now, but there is a massive change in how it's it looks compared to the original mandate that was released in September of 2022. The new mandate released in April of this year doesn't mention Māori at all. The original one mentioned Māori 10 times. It doesn't mention Te Tiriti at all. The original one mentioned it three times. Um, and it doesn't mention the Pacific at all. It also doesn't mention the waste hierarchy and other essential things um, that were mentioned in the, in the original mandate. So these are all stuff that we need to be making sure that government prioritise or reprioritise, because right now they're just getting fed information from industry and that's becoming policy. Um, so yeah, the more noise we can make, I think the more power we have. Um, so yeah, now I'm here, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, I don't know if Tracy, you have any final reflections on, yeah, where where to from here and your hopes for, you know, an ambitious treaty. Um, I just, I, I, I never know quite what to say to Matt and and Jeresa, particularly because I, I don't want to sound patronising, but I just have so much good things to say about how talk about indefatigable. I mean, honestly. They have the hardest job ever. They're walking into a really unfriendly colonial space. It's really unsafe. It's exhausting. They're completely overpowered. Um, although you wouldn't know it when you hear their interventions and the work that they do, they are powerful, Re really courageous, really powerful. So they have the hardest job and there is no, um, there's no confusion about that. I think everybody knows that. Um, and when Jeresa was saying that, you know, people listen, they really listen. I, I know that the Pacific Islands have been the moral voice throughout the um, Plastics Treaty, but since the IPC, the Indigenous Peoples Caucus, really gathered in strength, nobody can nobody can ignore them anymore. It's just not possible. It doesn't matter if they're a smaller number. They are really powerful in their small numbers. And that's extremely important, but it's also, it must be just so exhausting and emotionally taxing and spiritually, spiritually taxing. Um, so, you know, I just, I always feel awful when I sort of say this, because it's like, I don't, I don't mean it to be sounding patronizing. It's just, I'm just so awestruck um, by um, how they do keep going. Um, and yeah, their endurance is phenomenal, but it's not even their endurance. They're just picking up speed every time and they're more visible and louder every time as well, which is incredible. Um, I think just just finally, just really quickly, just I guess, um, as Olga said, I, this is not no time to rest. So even if we are feeling tired, we just basically have to basically pull our britches up and, and keep moving here. We've got such a short time to get as much done as we need to get done. There's a lot to be done. Um, so I think it's just a matter of putting pressure on governments is really all we can do at this point for civil society. There's much pressure as we can on governments. Um, keep talking to the media, tell them what's going on, because people, honestly, people just don't know about this treaty still, even after all of this time. The everyday New Zealander just doesn't know. We know because we're swimming around it every day, and we forget that others just don't really know what this is about, and they don't know what's going on, and they don't know about how unfair this process is, and I'm not just talking about it at a global level, as you can hear. I'm talking about a national level as well. Um, so if anybody has time to respond to the cabinet mandate situation or the fact that New Zealand's not sending our many 
world leading experts, but also our domestic national, you know, leaders. Um, yeah, please do. And I'm willing to help. It's just time is, is, is difficult to get that done amongst everything else. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Kia ora. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jessica, and thanks to all of you. Um, it's really helpful, I think, to hear what we can all do to support your mahi um, and this long struggle to get a, you know, to, to, to combat plastic pollution. Um, and I'll just add that um, we, uh, the Aotearoa Plastic Pollution Alliance, always keen for new members um, to support this mahi as well. Um, and yeah, and continue having, you know, loud voices um, to call out the government and its um you know racist and unambitious agenda uh, around this stuff um and yeah so please you know you're welcome to join us check out our website um but also just um keep following and supporting the mahi of of these amazing people so yeah just want to thank you so much Tricia, matt and olga uh, and also dress and andrew for being here and, and sharing your focado and your wisdom and your your expert knowledge um around and your yeah, your experience of, of actually going out there and representing all of us really and, and our planet um, for this mahi. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, could I just, could I pass back to you Val to um, close us off for the day? Um, Kaita mihi ki a koutou, um, he karakia ki te whakamutunga i tēnei kōrero o tēnei um, rā. Uh, kia horo, hora te marino, kia whakapapa paunamu, Te moana he huarahi mā tātou i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato i a tato katoa. Homie huie, tai kie. Tai kie. Thank you everybody from the Zero Waste Network. Thanks very much, Liam, from um, yeah, from all of us and to all of the people involved with the with the tr with the negotiations. Thank you mm. so much from all civil society across Aotearoa. We really, really, really appreciate the work that you are doing on behalf of all of us. Kaita mihi kia koutou. Mm. Kia ora.